How's it everyone and a very warm welcome to you on this the 10th lecture of Gen 115E Physical Science. My name is Kai Foster as always and today we will be having a look at the second of two lectures on oscillatory motion and waves. So what can we expect in today's lecture? Well, let's have a look. So starting off we're going to be looking at the Doppler effect. Now this is basically an application of sound waves and you'll see in a little bit how frequencies and all of that are altered based on relative motion between an observer and a source. We're then going to look at ultrasound. Again, that is going to be another application of sound waves before having a look at electromagnetic waves. So these, as you'll soon find out, are very different to sound waves. And we're going to finish off then by looking at radiation, which is also going to be an extension of electromagnetic waves. So without wasting any more time, let's get right into it and have a look at the Doppler effect. So before we start getting into the nitty gritty bits of the Doppler effect, basically the best example of the Doppler effect is if you're standing on the side of the road, a motorbike drives past you and makes that meow sort of sound. Now that is an exact example of what the Doppler effect sounds like or basically what we would observe when the Doppler effect is taking place. So basically the reason we hear this change in the sound is due to a change in the observed frequency of the sound waves. And this is basically due to relative motion which is occurring between the source, so where the sound is coming from, and the observer, so whoever is hearing the sound. So the Doppler shift is basically the application of the Doppler effect taking place. And basically what the Doppler shift is is the actual change in frequency due to the relative motion between the source, so where the sound's coming from, and the observer, whoever is listening to the sound. So as the source of the sound moves towards you, so there we have the relative motion, the frequency will basically be appearing to be higher, and as a result, this is going to make the pitch higher, and the wavelengths will, as a result, then be shorter. So this can happen to any wave type, but it's more pronounced with sound waves since the speed of sound is finite compared to the speed of light. We'll also find out in a few slides time that the Doppler effect can also be used to observe the movement of galaxies far, far away from us. So having a look at this diagram below, we can get a better understanding of the Doppler effect. So over here we have the car, which is basically the source of the sound. And we're assuming that all of the sound is coming from that tiny little blue point in the middle over there. I'll just go over it again to make that clear. And as we know, sound will basically travel radially outwards, so equally out in all directions. And in this case, since there is no movement, all of or relative movement between the observer and the source, each of these sound waves or the disturbances in the air, as we already know in our sound waves, are basically just areas of higher and lower pressure propagating outwards. We know that the sound is going to be distributed out evenly in those spherical sort of shapes over there, as we can see. So those little spheres around the car, those are representing the sound waves traveling. And here we see if the source is stationary, so if it's not movement, moving, <laughs> then all of the spheres representing the air compressions in the sound will be consistent, and the stationary observers on either side observe the same wavelength and frequency exactly as it was emitted by the source. Now, in the next few slides, we're going to be having a look at what happens if there is movement between the observer and the source, so this relative motion as I spoke about. So on this slide, we see now the car is moving. So again, these little blue dots over here, which I'm just going over, those represent the points of emission of the sound, so the point that the sound is basically coming from. And in this case over here, the car is basically going to be moving forward. And numbers one to five, so each of those points represent a different moment in time where the car is basically emitting that sound radially outwards, as we can see over there. So now we see, okay, the car is moving from left to right, away from person X and towards person Y. And this basically means now we have relative motion between the source and the observer. So the source, of course, being the car and the observers being person X and Y. So as the car moves along, it is still basically emitting sound as time goes on. But that point of emission, so that point where the sound is coming from, is moving as well. And this will basically cause air compressions on the right-hand side. So over here, this, this region right there, 
basically these air compressions are going to be closer together, causing the wavelength to be shorter and therefore the pitch to be higher. And that's basically because as the points of emission moves forwards, it's releasing another points of emission and they're going to be closer together compared to on the left hand side, which I'll circle in red. So over here, we see that as the sound is emitted, then the, the source or the, the, the point of emission, so the source of the sound is going to be basically moving forwards and away from the previous point of emission. So as a result, we see that the distance between the compressions is bigger. This will create a longer wavelength, and as a result, the, the pitch will be lower, uh, the frequency as well, the observed frequency at least. So in the last point here, the shorter wavelengths on the approaching side of the source explain why the observed frequency and pitch will be higher as the source approaches and lower as it moves away. So important to remember, if you have something moving towards you, then the observed frequency will be higher. So it sounds as if it's higher than it actually is. And if you've got a sound moving away from you, then the sound is going to, or the, the pitch will appear lower than what it actually is. Okay, and we've got the last case over here, where basically the car in the middle will remain stationary, but we have the observers moving. So we've got a stationary source, and we've got movement of the observer. So we've got person Y running towards the car, and we've got person X running away from the car. So when this happens, basically person Y, the observer moving towards the source, will receive the sound waves at a higher frequency and therefore it will sound as if the pitch is higher. On the other hand, the person moving away from the sound will receive the, the sound waves at a lower frequency and a longer wavelength and as a result the pitch will be a little bit lower. So basically between this slide and the previous one, there really isn't a significant difference. There's still relative motion between the source and the observer and it's the relative motion that we're really interested in. It doesn't necessarily matter whether the source or the observer is moving. So having a look at some applications of the Doppler effect. So it's a really useful phenomenon because whenever there's relative motion between two objects or specifically an observer and a source, then we can use the Doppler effect to help us understand things or calculate things like velocity, for example. So one example of this is basically when we are measuring the flow of blood through an artery or a vein, it is possible to do an ultrasound through that vein and basically reflect the ultrasound off the blood back to the receiver, and then you can calculate the velocity of the blood traveling through that vein. Then another interesting application is basically determining the movement of galaxies. So in this case over here, we have our observer. We can just draw a little man. Um, Cool, so we can assume that is our person on Earth looking at the galaxies through a telescope. So basically the velocity and movement of the galaxies can be determined. So for example, if we have a galaxy over here where I'm drawing this blue dot. We see, okay, great, it's moving towards the observer. So what happens when there's relative motion towards the observer? Then basically the observed frequency will become higher. So if the observed frequency is higher, then basically it's going to shift towards a shorter wavelength. And as we can see on this diagram over here, the shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies correspond to blue light. So basically what this means is if the color of the galaxy is shifting more towards the blue um, side of the spectrum, then we know it's moving towards us. On the other hand, if the galaxy on the right hand side over there at C if the color shift is going towards red, then that implies that there is motion or that the frequency is basically decreasing and the wavelength is getting longer as we can see over here. So a longer wavelength corresponds to red. And as we know, a lower frequency or and as a result, a longer wavelength will correspond to motion away from the observer. So then we know for sure that if there is a red shift in the color of the galaxy, then the galaxy is moving away from the observer. Then lastly, we see the neutral case. We've got the galaxy right in the middle over there. So for that, basically, there's not going to be any color shift. So assuming it was white, chances are it will just remain white, uh, unless the entire galaxy is, for example, moving away uh, or towards, then that's obviously an exception. 
Uh, let me just get rid of those two arrows quickly. Cool. So, yeah, essentially, if we have the galaxy in the middle, that is just going to remain at white, as we see over there, the rest frame. And that would basically be used as a reference point to points A moving towards and points C moving away from the observer. So having a quick look at the equation for the Doppler effect, we see that f obs, which is the frequency of the observer or the observed frequency, is equal to the frequency of the source, fs, and then we're going to multiply that by the velocity of sound or the speed of sound, which is usually around 340 meters per second. And we're going to divide that by the speed of sound in that medium plus minus the speed of the source. So that will basically be the relative velocity between the source and the observer. So you'll see there that there's a plus and a minus as well. So in the event that the source is moving towards the observer, then the sign in the denominator will be negative. If the source is moving away from the observer or the relative distance between them is increasing, then the sign is going to be positive. So that's quite an important rule to remember at the bottom there. Movement towards, then the sign will be negative. Movement away, then the sign will be positive. So as always, here is a worked example that we can quickly go through just to help solidify our understanding and learn how to use the equations properly. So suppose that a train has a 150 hertz horn and it is moving at 35 meters per second on a still day where the speed of sound is 340 meters per second. So what frequencies are observed by a stationary person at the side of the tracks as the train approaches and after it passes? So writing down everything that we know, we know that the frequency of the source is going to be 150 hertz. We know that the speed of the source, the speed of the train is 35 meters per second. And we know that the speed of sound on this day is going to be 340 meters per second. So that what we're going to be looking for in each case is the frequency that is observed when the train is approaching in the first case. So just writing that down quickly. And then again when it is receding and we'll do that on the following slide. So while the train is approaching we can quickly write down our equation for observed frequency. So since the rate of motion means that the two objects or the source and the observer are coming closer together, then that basically means that in the denominator we will have a negative sign like that. Fantastic. Then putting in our known values, obviously the observed frequency is unknown. We know everything else. So we can pop in, okay, the frequency of the source is 150 hertz. And then we know the speed of sound as 340. And that's going to be divided by 340 minus the speed of the source, which is 35. There we go. We can pop that into our calculators. And we get that the observed frequency, so the frequency that the person standing at the platform hears as the train is approaching, will be 167 hertz. There we go. So as you can see, that is significantly higher compared to the 150 hertz of the actual source that it's giving off. And as we learned in the previous lecture, humans are really good at distinguishing differences in pitch. So you would definitely be able to hear that difference between 150 hertz and 167 hertz. So we then have the second part of the problem where the train is receding or moving away from the observer again. So we know if the relative motion means the distance is increasing between the observer and the source, then the sign in the denominator is going to be positive. So an increase in distance between the source and the observer means a positive sign in the denominator like that. And then again, we can just fill in our knowns and our unknowns. So the knowns will be the exact same as the past problem with the only difference being the positive in the in the denominator there. So again, 150 for the source frequency. VW, that's going to be 340 meters per second divided by 340 plus 35. Fantastic. Then if we pop that into our calculator, 
you will get that the observed frequency as the train is moving away is going to be 136 hertz. So again, there's a significant difference between 136 hertz and 150 hertz. So we would definitely notice the train moving away just based on the pitch difference. All right, so that is all on the Doppler effect. And we can now move on to another application of sound, which will be ultrasound. So just to recap what we already know about ultrasound, well, we know that ultrasound refers to any sound wave with a frequency above 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz, obviously kilo referring to a factor of 1,000. So there are many applications for ultrasound, and some of these examples will be burglar alarms, cleaning objects, and then some animals will also use ultrasound to get around, for example, bats or whales. So basically how that works is the bat will emit a signal um, above 20,000 hertz, a sound wave, and basically will bounce back. And then in the bat's ears, it can detect how far away something is. It can detect the movement of mice or you know anything that it's trying to hunt. And same with whales. They basically send out an ultrasound signal. It will bounce off the whatever object, and then they can get an idea of what their environment sort of looks like. Um, and then again, we also have ultrasound in medical applications, the classic one being for baby scans during the prenatal phase. So like all waves, ultrasound will carry energy and that will be absorbed by the medium carrying it. And these effects will basically vary with intensity. So in the last lecture, we looked at the intensity of a sound wave, and that is basically equal to the power of the source divided by the area that it is basically going over. So most of the energy carried by high intensity ultrasound in tissue will be converted to thermal energy. And this is really useful because when ultrasound is basically boosted to an intensity of 1000 to 100,000 watts per meter squared, so that's obviously the unit for intensity, then it can be used to literally shatter gallstones or destroy cancerous tissue during surgical procedures. So there's a, obviously a really useful benefit for ultrasound can literally be used to help get rid of cancer. So intensities of 1000 watts per meter squared to 10,000 watts per meter squared are commonly used for deep heat treatments called ultrasound diathermy. So again, we saw in the fourth point along here, so I'll just underline it quickly, but most of the energy carried by these high intensity ultrasound waves will be converted into thermal energy in organic tissues at least. So that makes sense then how when we use a relatively high intensity of ultrasound, it can be used for deep heat treatments um, during that ultrasound diathermy. So then just looking at some of the applications of ultrasound a little bit more closely. So we spoke about ultrasound diathermy in the previous slide, and basically athletes and physiotherapists will use ultrasound diathermy to help injured or overworked muscles. And how this works is basically it can help improve flexibility and relieve pain at the same time. And this is obviously well, not that obvious, but basically when ultrasound waves are focused on a tissue, then it can cause the tissue to warm up as we spoke about the deep heating, you know. And this is basically due to the thermal energy that is imparted by these waves. And if you're a physiotherapist using this treatment on a patient, then you need to be obviously be quite skilled to avoid something called bone burns and other tissue tissue damage. And this is caused by overheating. And the overheating, as I just said, is due to the higher levels of thermal energy that will be present because of the ultrasound wave intensities. And sometimes this can be made worse by the reflection and focusing of the ultrasound by joints and bone tissue. So then lastly, we know that ultrasound can also be used for imaging. When you hear the word ultrasound, usually the first thing that pops into your mind is the classic case of the mother having a baby scan in the prenatal phase of, of the child's development. So basically before the child is born, they can do an ultrasound to make sure that everything is fine, make sure that the child is developing properly, and also to look out for any abnormalities that may be arising early on. So obviously the earlier you find something, the more the, the easier it is to be able to treat it. So having a look at how ultrasound imaging works, how does that piece of apparatus that the doctor puts over the mother's stomach, how is it actually being able to put together that picture of what's going on under the 
under the skin layers. So basically ultrasonic waves, which as we know by now are waves above 20 kilohertz, are emitted from a piezoelectric transducer. And basically what this is, is a special type of crystal or semiconductor which exhibits the piezoelectric effect. So what this is, is basically when the expansion and contraction of a substance um, occurs, then a voltage can be applied across it and this can cause vibration of the crystal. So these high vibrations caused by the vibration of the crystal are then transmitted as sound waves into any tissue in contact with that transducer. So the crystal that produces this uh, ultrasonic wave will basically act as a transmitter, so it's sending the wave out, and it also acts as a receiver, so it's basically sending out and it's receiving these signals back, basically the signals that are reflected off the tissue. And if the pressure is applied to the crystal, so basically when the waves are returning, they're going to be slight uh, pressure vari variations in the air or in the medium due to the movement of the waves, then basically what will happen is a voltage can be produced. Also, this is a result of the piezoelectric effect. So if there's any pressure applied to this crystal, to that transducer, then the voltage will be produced. And this voltage can obviously be recorded and analyzed through some sophisticated computer software. And what happens then is an image will be created. So ultrasound is also partially absorbed by any tissue along its path. And this will be during the emission stage. So when the ultrasonic waves get sent out and the reflection stages. So when the ultrasonic waves have reflected off the tissue and they're returning to the transducer or the crystal. So from the time between when the original signal is sent and when the reflections from various boundaries between the media, so the media being things, if you're scanning a person, that could be things like any bone tissue, connective tissue, blood, and so forth. Then when, when the original signal is sent and the reflections are received again in the transducer, then basically the position and the layouts of every boundary between the tissues and organs can be determined. And then that is basically the image that will appear on the computer screen. So as mentioned, there are numerous benefits of using ultrasound in medical applications. And the first benefit is that it's pretty safe. So, so far in medical diagnostics, so diagnosing a problem, there haven't been any risks that have been discovered yet. So we know for sure that ultrasound doesn't have any risk of causing cancer or anything like that, such as um, a different type of diagnostic like x-rays or gamma rays. And yeah, there are basically numerous benefits and applications within the medical field. So the intensities when we use ultrasound for imaging is too low to cause any thermal damage of surrounding tissues. Obviously, it's going to be a different story if the ultrasound diathermy is being used as a treatment to basically help heal the muscles and improve the flexibility and so forth. So again, the ultrasound, as we said, it's very safe and it's going to be a far safer alternative compared to x-rays which do unfortunately cause cancer over prolonged exposure to the x-rays. So the more sensitive ultrasounds can reveal remarkable detail and can even produce 3D mapping once the transducer signals have been interpreted by a computer. So you can literally do a quick Google search and type in 3D mapping ultrasound and you can get some vividly accurate 3D images of say for example, a baby in its mother's womb still. So the most common use, obviously we know prenatal scans. So during pregnancy, those scans to ensure the correct development, that's probably the most common use. And in addition to that, you can scan for any abnormalities within a body or, a, or a, an organism and can also perform heart scans to make sure everything's all right. So again, I think the fact that they use ultrasound to, to find out what's happening with the baby goes to show how safe it is because obviously you don't want to be shining x-rays through the baby because I mean even the the deformation or the damaging of you know a few cells can then cause uh, something like cancer or so, or so forth in the baby just because at there at that phase where there's still rapid growth and you obviously want to make sure that it's going to be as safe as possible to ensure the normal development of the child. All right, so that was that with ultrasound. And now we're going to be moving away from sound waves completely to have a look at electromagnetic waves. 
So just a heads up, electromagnetic waves are significantly different to the waves that we've dealt with so far, such as sound waves, waves that occur in the ocean and so forth. And they have unique characteristics. And I think the key differentiating factor between electromagnetic waves and the other waves we've looked at so far is that electromagnetic waves do not require any medium to travel or propagate through. And they are able to travel through something like a vacuum. So they literally need absolutely nothing to basically travel through space. So a very easy example of this is basically the UV radiation from the sun. So it travels through space and needs absolutely no medium to arrive from the sun to the earth. So obviously, like I said, UV radiation, just the, the light from the sun as well. Light's another example of electromagnetic um, waves. So when a current, so this is basically looking at how electromagnetic waves come about. It's based on this principle over here which when a current travels through a wire, so just a, a you know an electrically conducting wire, so I do apologize about the motorbike that just drove past there, but basically when a current travels through a wire, a magnetic field is produced around the wire. So we can see that at the bottom of the page. I'll just circle that in red quickly. So we've got a we've got a current traveling through this wire over here, and what happens then is we will get a magnetic field, and that will be basically these hoops over here, the magnetic field will be traveling around the wire in that orientation. So this is, like I said, the basis from which electromagnetic waves were discovered, the phenomenon through which electric field lines and magnetic field lines coexist. So also when there is a change in magnetic fields, this will produce a change in the current due to a change in the electromotive force. So this might be ringing some bells for you from matric. And on the other hand, as well, a changing electric field will also produce a magnetic field. And obviously, the changing electric field could be due to the movement of a current, for example. So just picking up where we left off on the previous slide, we said that when there is a change in electric field, there will be a change in magnetic field and vice versa. So basically, when a current varies, then there's going to be a change in that electric field and therefore the magnetic field as well. So how do we get a current that varies? Well, simple, we can have an AC generator or an alternating current generator, which produces a current which does something like this. So if we have time on the x-axis and current I on the y-axis, then basically an alternating current will look something like this. So the current basically goes up and down. It's varying between a positive and a negative amplitude, and that is what can create a change in current. So when this happens, there's going to be the changing electric field and therefore a changing magnetic field. So the electric field E, if we look at this over here, we've got the wire that they speak about in the problem running along there. That is the wire. Then basically, when there is a change in the current, then the electric field is going to change as the charge dis distribution varies. So the changing field will propagate outwards and that will be in all directions. So it won't just be out here, it'll be going along pretty much the whole length of this piece of wire here. It'll be going out to the left. It'll be going, um, yeah, basically in all directions, radially outwards from the wire. And obviously, if we have this changing electric field, we're going to have a changing magnetic field as well, which we can see over there. So important thing about the electromagnetic waves, first of all, the electric field and the magnetic field are at 90 degrees to each other. So if we just write that in there, we can say that E is parallel to B. Maybe we can just go over this in the colors just to make everything a little easier to follow. It's going to be perpendicular to B like that. Cool. And we know as well that, okay, we, we've spoken about them being at 90 degrees. We know as well that they're going to travel at the speed of light. So that's another property of electromagnetic waves. They will travel at the speed of light regardless of the medium that they travel through because as we've already mentioned the medium through which an electromagnetic waves is irrelevant they do not need any medium to travel through at all so electromagnetic waves are also put into categories and these categories are basically determined by the waves wavelength and frequency which are obviously very closely related so some of these categories from the smallest wavelength to the largest will be Gamma rays, followed by X-rays, ultraviolet, visible light spectrum, so that's colors that we can literally see with our own eyes. That's another form of electromagnetic waves. And then with longer wavelengths, we have infrared, 
microwaves and radio waves. So there's also three general rules of thumb when it comes to electromagnetic waves, and this is basically to do with their wavelength and their frequency. So electromagnetic waves with higher frequencies are far more energetic, and the more energetic they are, the more they are able to penetrate through different materials. So for example, if you have a higher energy wave such as a gamma ray, it'll be a lot better at penetrating, say for example, through skin for an X-ray compared to something like a microwave. So higher frequency electromagnetic waves will be more energetic, more able to penetrate, um, and lower frequency waves, sorry, apologies about the motorbike driving past there, lower frequency waves will be obviously not as effective at penetrating and will be less energetic. Then the second rule is that high, in, high frequency electromagnetic waves can carry more information per unit time than low frequency waves. And lastly, the shorter the wavelength of any electromagnetic wave probing a material, the smaller the detail it is possible to resolve. So basically that means the shorter the wavelength being shone onto a material or propagating through a medium, the more detail it will be able to offer as a result. So for example, a gamma ray being shone through a body will be able to provide more detail since it's got a shorter wavelength compared to something like X-rays or infrared rays and so forth. So over here we just have a diagram of how electromagnetic waves move, how they propagate. So first of all, we have the direction of propagation over here. So this is the direction that the wave is going to be moving in. So in this problem here, we might have, say, a wire like that with a current running through it. Just say current's going in that direction and that will result in a, an electric field which will be traveling radially outwards from the wire through which the current is running. So as I said in the previous slide, we can see that the electric field E is going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field B, like that. So that's very important to remember. And as you can see, they're going to be in phase as well. So basically when the amplitude of one increases, so does the other. And when the amplitude decreases, then so too does the other as well. And that's all perfectly in phase, meaning they basically have crests and troughs at the exact same point. So as always, wavelength is going to be the distance between two identical points on the wave as it propagates outwards. And based on what was said in the previous slide, we know that the electric field is going to be moving up and down like that. And the magnetic wave is going to be traveling from left to right or into and out of the page, depending on how you're looking at it. Okay, then just to reiterate a few key characteristics of electromagnetic waves. So first of all, we know that electromagnetic waves propagate at the speed of light and they do not require any medium to travel through, unlike most other waves, which will require some sort of medium uh, to transfer that energy via the disturbances. So we also know that the electromagnetic waves will propagate outwards from a source radially outwards, so going outwards in like that, that sort of circular shape as we've seen, and that will sometimes form complex radiation patterns. Then lastly, electromagnetic waves will carry energy away from their source, similar to a sound wave carrying energy away from a standing wave on a guitar string. So Unlike something like, say, our ears, for example, which can receive sound waves, an antenna for receiving electromagnetic waves will need to produce a, basically produce a certain frequency and it will need to resonate that frequency in order to attract the incoming electromagnetic waves to it. So that obviously works in reverse to how it works for something like a sound wave. And yeah, basically to reiterate, the receiver antenna needs to also be resonating at some certain frequency to receive the waves. Then over here we see the electromagnetic spectrum ranging from radio waves through microwaves, infrared, visible light spectrum, ultraviolet rays, x-rays, all the way up to gamma rays. And we can basically see a few key things about each of these waves here. So first of all, second from the top in this slide over here, we see the wavelength. And as the, as the graph goes from left to right, we see the wavelengths getting smaller and smaller and smaller until we get all the way down to gamma rays. 
We then also given the magnitudes of the wavelengths and basically an approximate scale of how big it is. So how big can we perceive these waves to actually be? So we start off with radio waves, which are comparable in size to buildings, supposedly. Then we get to microwaves, which are usually in the range of centimeters, and that's comparable to a butterfly. Then we get to infrared rays, which are basically in the order of 10 to the negative 5. So that's nearly a millionth of a meter. So it'll be 10 millionths of a meter, which is pretty small, that to the range for infrared. And that's comparable to a needle point. We then get to visible light, which is comparable to protozoans. And then we get to the small end of the spectrum, where we've got tiny wavelengths. So we end up at the gamma ray, which is comparable to an atomic nuclei. So that's the middle part of the atom, which is ridiculously small. Then at the bottom, we can just see a range of frequencies. So it ranges from 10 to the power of 4, which should be 10,000 hertz. And it ranges all the way up to 10 to the power of 20 hertz. So that is a ridiculously high frequency there that the gamma rays have. Um, again, we know that a longer wavelength will correspond usually to a high, lower frequency. Sorry, my bad. And we also know that a shorter wavelength and higher frequency will make a, a wave more penetrating and basically give it a higher energy rating as well. All right, then having a look at some of these waves up close, just learning a little bit more about each of them specifically. So starting off with radio waves, which as we should hopefully know by now, have the longest wavelength out of all the electromagnetic waves in the range usually of about 10 to the power of three meters or in the range of almost kilometers even, or a few hundred meters. The frequency range for radio waves ranges between three hertz and one gigahertz, so that's 10 to the power of nine hertz, so it's quite a big range as you can see over there. And usually radio waves are used for long distance transfer of energy or information. So your car radio, for example, where you've got the AM and FM channels, you basically will be receiving radio waves in your car, and as we know, radio radio stations can uh, basically transfer these signals across the whole country. If we look at 5FM, for example, they're based up in Joburg, and we can listen to it no problem down here. So that's an example of radio waves being used for long distance transfer of energy and information. TV signals, again, as well, we know that, you know, TV stations are set up all around the country, and usually they are able to transmit their signals around an entire country with no problem. And there's also an ongoing debate as to whether these waves are harmful to human health. I'm sure you've heard about the cell phone debate. Does the, do the waves going to and from your cell phone potentially cause cancer or the altering of our DNA structures? Then having a look at microwaves, which have the second longest wavelength in the electromagnetic, <laughs> electromagnetic spectrum. There we go. So it's quite a bit shorter compared to radio waves. And the range of the frequencies is between 1 gigahertz, so 10 to the power of 9 hertz, up to, I think, to the 10 to the power of 12 is tera, so up to 1 terahertz, which is also ridiculously high. And it's got a higher frequency, and a higher frequency corresponds to higher energy of the wave. And if there's higher energy, then more information can be transferred. So microwaves outside of the household can be used for communications, uh, basically also transferring signals over long distances and radar, another key use of or application of microwaves. And of course, we have our classic microwave in the household. And how this happens is basically there will be thermal agitation of the atoms and molecules, resulting in them basically vibrating at a higher frequency. And when this happens, heating will occur because as we know, a higher average kinetic energy or internal energy of an object will result in a higher temperature. And again, there are debates as to whether microwaves are harmful to human health. I know that some people refuse to keep a microwave in their kitchen because they believe that it's uh, damaging to to our cells or our DNA, um, but obviously each to their own. All right, so infrared radiation is generally produced through thermal motion, and thermal motion generally comes about from the vibration of atoms and molecules. And this, as we know by now, will result in an increasing average kinetic energy of the object or an increase in the internal energy. And as a result, that will raise the temperature and increase the thermal energy of the object in question. So small systems and particles are capable of vibrating fast enough to produce 
these infrared waves. And one of the applications of infrared radiation is basically thermal cameras, which can allow us to produce thermal images of what is happening. So something like night vision goggles as well, those will work in a similar way where the thermal camera will basically perceive the radiation being emitted by emitted by certain bodies or objects. So what happens is the thermal lens, lens will capture this radiation and it will transfer these colors into the visible light spectrum. So basically a hotter temperature will correspond to a warmer color like bright orange or yellow or even up to white if it's extremely hot. And on the other side, if it's a cooler object, that will be corresponding more to your blue or your purple shades. And in that way, we can basically use radiant heat to produce thermal images. So in your guys' field, we are able to use infrared therapy for physiotherapy, and that will basically help with managing acute or chronic pain. So what that looks like, it's literally like a little handheld thing, almost looks uh, kind of like a torch with the, um, with the light and shining down to the side. And basically you can then put that over your pets or humans, obviously, in some cases, you guys are obviously dealing with veterinary physiotherapy, but you can focus it on the heat and then you are able to basically warm up the area and basically help release tension and get rid of the acute or chronic pain. So looking at visible light then, as we've, as I have mentioned earlier in this lecture, visible light is also a form of electromagnetic uh, radiation or an electromagnetic wave. So every color that you can see is basically the result of your eyes interpreting these electromagnetic waves and turning them into useful signals in your brain. So it's quite a narrow band. It, the, the range of wavelengths and frequencies at which visible light occurs is very small compared to the range of electromagnetic frequencies or you know, if you look at something like the gamma rays, which are up to 10 to the power of 20 hertz and all the way down to the radio waves, which can be as low as, what was that? I think, 3 hertz. Uh, so red light has the longest wavelength and violet has the shortest wavelength. So that also makes sense. We've got infrared, which is basically a wavelength a little bit longer than red light. And then we've got ultraviolet on the other side of that. So that's going to have a wavelength a little bit shorter than the violet light in the visible spectrum. So visible light is basically produced by the vibrations and rotations of atoms and molecules, as well as by electronic transitions within atoms and molecules. And over there we can see the visible light spectrum. So it goes from red all the way through to violet. And basically this is um, the same as the colors of the rainbow. You know, So if you have white light shining through a prism, then we will have the the full spectrum of colors basically being produced. It's like the Pink Floyd album cover. That's probably the, the best analogy that I can think of off the top of my head. And then again, you'll see over here on this end of the spectrum, infrared is going to be a little bit longer wavelength than the red light. And on the other side, we see that ultraviolet is going to have a slightly shorter wavelength than the violet visible light. So obviously going from left to right on that diagram, we know that the further across we go, the shorter the wavelength is going to become, and the shorter the wavelength, generally the higher the frequency will be as well, and that means that the waves are capable of carrying and transferring more energy. So moving on to look at ultraviolet radiation. So ultraviolet, or UV for short, is actually split up into three different types, and these are UVA, UVB, and UVC. And basically, the way these are categorized is based on their wavelengths. So you can see there, UVA will have the longer wavelength and therefore a lower energy associated with it, and UVC will have a shorter wavelength and therefore higher energy associated with it. So 99% of the solar UV radiation reaching the Earth's surface is UVA. So again, we can look there, we see that's the longest wavelength. So of those three, it is the least harmful. So that's probably good news for us because B and C are mostly absorbed by the ozone layer. So then each of these types of UV radiation have different applications. So first of all, we see UVA is necessary for vitamin D production. As we know, if we are in the sun for enough time, then we will have generally healthy vitamin D levels. And one thing that actually came to light through the whole coronavirus crisis is that one, having high levels of vitamin D was more likely to keep you healthy from the virus 
And I think that goes to show how often, you know, we're almost too scared of the sun these days. We're too scared of getting something like skin cancer, when it's actually very, very important to get sun exposure. On that note as well, I mean, speaking from personal experience, if I spend time out in the sun, obviously not to the point where I'm like burnt to a crisp, but if you spend time in the sun, you naturally feel elevated, more energetic and just generally happier. You know, and I think this is as a direct result of the vitamin D production and slight UV exposure. UVB can excite DNA molecules, so basically gets them to vibrate higher and higher, and obviously that will increase thermal energy, and this can result in mutations and cancers. So that's that's the problematic part of the sun. You know, if we get too much UVB, we can end up getting skin cancer way down the line. UV can also be used for sterilization of items, so often in hospitals to get rid of microorganisms and all of that. And excessive exposure can cause adverse effects such as cataracts or panis. Panis is basically extra growth in the joints. I'm sure if you haven't learned about that yet in one of your physio courses, then you will sometime this year or next year. So extra radiation, now that's going to be a far higher frequency and a far shorter wavelength compared to ultraviolet radiation. And because of this higher frequency and shorter wavelength, it is going to be far more penetrative, allowing it to basically travel through um, travel through different types of objects and medium more efficiently. And it's going to be able to carry extremely high amounts of energy as well. So as you've probably heard by now, X-rays can have adverse effects on living cells and tissues. And you know, if you're constantly exposed to X-rays in some or other form, chances are you might start developing tumors or cancer or something like that. And we can also use X-rays for, for, or to our benefit rather. So based on the fact that it's able to carry high amounts of energy and it is very penetrative and it can have adverse effects on tissue, we can basically come to the conclusion that X-rays can be used to kill cancer cells, which it is absolutely used for from time to time. Um, so mostly, as we know, the classic X-ray is used for diagnostic imaging. So that will obviously be through X-ray photos. You know, if you break a bone, you go get an X-ray done and then the doctor can uh, basically prescribe a treatment. And CAT scans or CT scans are also another application of X-rays. All right, then lastly, looking at gamma radiation with a slightly freaky image there on the far right hand side. So that's basically a gamma ray scan of the body. So we know that gamma rays are the most penetrating type of electromagnetic waves or radiation. They carry the most energy by far. They've got a very high frequency, as we saw it was about in the range of 10 to the power of 20 hertz, which is extremely high. And in addition to that, they've got very short wavelengths, far shorter than X-rays. So one of the places that gamma radiation is emitted is through the nucleus of the atom. And this can be either from natural nuclear decay. So for example, we use this process in something like carbon dating, where we can look at the isotopes within an atom and we can see how much radiation is still being released. And we can then therefore look at the half-life of that atom. So how long it takes for half of the radiation to decay. And based on the amount of radiation that this atom or collection of atoms is releasing, we are able to then tell how old this, this um, artifact is actually. Uh, another slightly less fortunate application of gamma radiation is in nuclear processes, in nuclear reactors and weapons. So obviously nuclear processes can be beneficial in the form of nuclear power plants, but we have also seen that something like the atomic bomb is a thing and that has caused mass destruction throughout the world in the past. So gamma radiation can be used for body scans because obviously gamma rays are extremely penetrating. So you're able to get more accurate um, imaging almost compared to X-rays even. But at the same time, these gamma rays aren't used as frequently uh, for body scans just because they're extremely harmful. And another application of gamma radiation is basically to kill microorganisms in our food and to irradiate food. So sometimes you might see with black pepper, for example, it'll say on the bottle that it has been irradiated. And that's basically another application of gamma radiation. Okay, then onto the last section for today's lecture, we'll be having a quick look at radiation. Okay, so just having a look at nuclear radioactivity to start off with, which is essentially the source of a lot of radiation that we come across in our everyday lives. 
So nuclear radioactivity is basically the act of emitting radiation spontaneously. How does this happen? Well, it happens through an unstable atomic nucleus. So the nucleus, of course, being the part of the atom in the middle made up of neutrons and protons. So why does this happen? Well, basically, when an atomic nucleus is in, in an unstable state, then basically the nucleus will try to give away some of that energy to try and return to a more stable configuration. So again, this is following the natural law of equilibrium, which we have come across so many times already in this course. So radioactive decay is basically the process by which an unstable atomic nucleus loses energy by radiation. So something like uranium, that is a mineral or an element that we are able to mine. And of course, there the atomic nuclei will be extremely unstable, hence the radioactivity and radiation being emitted by a material like that. So radio, radioactive material, like uranium, for example, that I just spoke about, is essentially just a material that contains an unstable nucleus. And then radioactive decay can also be split into three different categories. So first of all, we have alpha, and essentially what that is, is the emission of a helium nucleus and is positively charged. We get beta, where essentially there is the emission of an electron from an atom. And lastly, we have gamma, gamma radioactive decay, which is the emission of a high energy proton by a nucleus. So it has no charge and it comes from the de excitation of a nucleus. Uh, this last point over here, just for some background info, you don't need to be learning those off by heart, so no need to stress too much about that. Then just finishing up this extremely short section on radiation, we're going to be looking at a type of radiation that is a lot more relevant to you as budding veterinary physiotherapists. So that is going to be laser radiation. And essentially what laser stands for is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but there we have the acronym for what laser stands for. And in our everyday lives, there are extensive uses for laser. So for example, reading barcodes, if you go to the shop and you get your item scanned, then that basically uses laser to read that barcode. Obviously communications then. Your printer will also use a form of laser to basically put the ink onto the paper. And then we also know that CDs and DVDs require laser to basically read what is happening or what information is kept on that disc. Then we also have applications of laser in the weapons industry and the medical industry, both for surgical and therapeutic. So as budding veterinary physiotherapists, you will also very likely come across laser at some point. And basically physiotherapists can use laser to help relieve patients' pain, to accelerate healing and to decrease inflammation in joints. So the source of laser is basically a single wavelength electromagnetic radiation and it can be precisely manipulated depending on the required application. And what this means is basically the intensity can be adjusted based or depending on what the required application is. So essentially you can raise the intensity to such a point where you can literally cut through solid objects using a laser beam. And this happens quite often. There's a whole industry in engineering which deals with um, CNC and laser cutting and all of that. And it's basically an extremely accurate way of being able to cut through certain materials. And then lastly, we see here the laser can act as a temporary store energy storage device. So basically the, the source of the, of the laser in the little crystal there that can act as an energy storage device before converting that energy into the electromagnetic radiation and basically sending that out as a beam of light. Okay, and that is all from me for today. Thank you all so much for joining. Thank you for listening if you made it this far. And as always, if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to drop me an email at kaifoster23 at gmail.com, or alternatively, you can wait till the online session to ask any questions that you might have. And that will be the online session corresponding to tutorial five, where we'll look at lectures nine and 10, which I believe was just the two lectures on 
oscillatory motion and waves. Only two lectures to go for the whole course. Congratulations on making it this far. Time has really been flying by so far this year. And yeah, I'll basically be seeing you guys soon for the online session. All the best until then.